Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com. I'm with Mr. Eric Chang of Lytro. Hello. It's really a pleasure to be here. I was just told that they've been watching my videos about Lytro for the past little while, so they know all about the past um, things that I've said, but that's okay. So we're moving on from there. So I got to finally, we get a hands on with Lytro, which is great. We can uh, talk to Eric. How long have you been using it? I've been using it for about nine months, prototypes, yeah. How did you keep it concealed? Uh, we made masks. So the first one was basically foam and gaffer's tape. And, and what did it look like? Because it is a weird form factor to begin with, which I'm sure we can talk about, but did you make it look like a regular camera or just something uh, weird? No, this, it sort of looked like binoculars, and it was you know, wrapped in tape, and people just, we just told people that uh, it was a prototype camera our friends wanted us to test. Well, that's cool. So, you know, being that I, at first I called it a, I thought it was an app because it seemed to be software driven. Because you know, the, the sample images that we saw, uh, it just seemed like you would put it in an app and this would happen. But it, it, it really seems like there's a lot of software driven things going on back here that it's more than just taking a picture. There's raw data of your Lytro file that you, dot L, FP. Oh, dot dot LFP. LFP. Okay, so yeah, tell me about the software. Is it primarily software or is it hardware or is it a combination of both? It is uh, absolutely a combination of both. So it's hardware and software working in concert, and one would not work without the other. Absolutely. All right. So the yeah. It's good. So what what is the practical use that you see for this? As a you're you're a working professional photographer, right? Yes, I'm a working. Professional. So what do you what do you see the practical use of you having it? Do you see it more as a consumer thing, a, a, a fun thing to have in your bag, or can, would you actually use it for some sort of? Uh, photography purposes. Well, not photography purposes, but for a professional purpose. Yeah, it's been interesting. We, so the common thread we've had in our, well, first of all, this camera allows you to refocus pictures after the fact. A little bit of context. I know most of your, yep. your viewers probably already know that. Um, that's the first thing we're, we're releasing. Um, and what we found is that people who are looking for new creative avenues in photography and imaging are the ones that tend to be interested in, in the Lytro camera. So we have those, of course, we also have gadget people who just have to have the newest thing. We knew we would get those people, those folks sure. interested. Uh, in terms of the, the pros or the serious hobbyists, we've had uh, definitely a mixed response. So of course the technology is very exciting and nobody is disputing that unless they don't actually know what it does. Um, the first camera, however, is not targeted at the professional market, and uh, it is really, it's really made for consumers, it's made for people who want to see what light field photography is about, tell stories using uh, a more interactive uh, display of these pictures. Um, so I, I think, you know, it is for everyone, but it is also, it's very specifically for people who have interest in these, these sorts of creative outlets. Um, and the pros, of course, the things that they're frustrated with will be fixed in the future. I mean, we, this has tied photography to computation. And we know how fast computers get better. And so we know this technology will improve very quickly. Sure. And it, it's, it's pretty amazing to think of what it does. When I, when I sat down and finally just said, look, you got to think of this as a new technology. It's going to evolve. Where is it going? It's here now as a, in, in a form. But as we know that your camera is going to get updates now, will the current model be upgradable or firmware updated to support whatever you come out with next, or are you going to have to get a whole new camera? Yes, so we will have firmware updates and software updates. Now, the firmware updates won't fundamentally change what is captured. We are already with this camera, the current camera that you can buy today, capturing the entire light field. So it's raw data. Now, the software updates will unlock more features so, you know, some of the th these things that we've mentioned that aren't in the camera yet, and I say in the camera, I really mean in the, in the system, are things like all-in-focus, 3D, perspective shift, those things. Those are software-only updates that do not require firmware. So, in the same way that you can go back, you know, Adobe released Lightroom 4, and there's a new process, 2012 yeah. process. So, you can go back and reprocess your old raw pictures and get that new process. Lightfield will work in the same way. We'll release a new process. It will unlock a new way to look at your pictures and potentially new things like, you know, for advanced photographers, you know, this idea of like tilt shift, for example, which is all faked now. You know, we have tilt shift in the camera in a more optically correct way. Yeah, because it can take all the raw data and do whatever you want with it, which is definitely interesting. Now, where I see it being it, something in the future in a pro model type camera is not so much the you know, let's take a picture of our hand and see what's in focus behind it, but more so if somebody misses focus on the eye, they can shift it over if they need to. Is that, what, what are the plans? Is it something that you plan on licensing out? I know this may be 
not your area, but it seems like is it something you're going to license or are you going to come out with more higher end cameras for pros? So we, we're, we don't, we're not saying what we're doing internally yet, um, but we also are not ruling anything out. So the licensing play may happen, but we're committed to building cameras at the moment and uh, building cameras specifically for consumers. Uh, and that can in include more advanced cameras down the line with pros. So this is really, it's not, it's not, it's a horn. It's a, it's a horn. It's a loud it's horn. It's a horn and somebody walked by. It's okay. No, it's okay. It's, it, we got a good look. Yeah. No, it's all right. We like that. Um, yeah. See, I lost my train of thought. It's all right. Uh, it was, uh, it, who's going to get the camera, the, the technology? And, I mean, I could see it being used in consumer cameras. Somebody wants to license that, a Nikon, Canon, Olympus, any one of those people. Um, but you have to be commended for making what you've made so far. It's pretty amazing. And what 3D technology coming? Something like that? Yeah, so 3D technology is coming, and uh, it is tied very closely to this, this idea of perspective shift. And this is something that's very hard to describe. It's much easier to see. Sure. But it's uh, the idea that you can change your point of view very slightly. So uh, you can sort of peek around an object very slightly, and that sort of movement gives you a tremendous idea of the depth of the scene. Um, but that same information allows us to show different pictures to each eye, which is exactly how you get the stereo 3D. So anyone with a stereo display whatever that means, you know, sometime this year, because that's changing quickly as well, will be able to retroactively process their pictures and get a stereo 3D view. That's awesome. And then, so any of the raw data they capture now, they'll be able to use in the future for creating that. That's this is what you yeah. said. So that's awesome. Now, one question I had, video. Is there a place where this falls in for capturing video? Yeah, so each capture is single frame capture, just like traditional camera. So. Light field technology is absolutely compatible with video. Uh, it's hard, though. Video will be difficult only because it, it's co processing, computationally intensive, storage intensive. We essentially, essentially, we need full resolution video capture. So we know that's possible because right. it's, it's here in the very high end, and we know that's going to trickle down, and hopefully Lytro can drive that forward because, you know, at the moment, video is tied to specific resolution standards, so cameras tend to come out that target those standards. But we can target sort of any high resolution uh, sensor, right. light field sensor, and output any, any size video on the back end, uh, whatever is appropriate. Uh, so that's certainly something we're looking into. Um, I think it's, it would be difficult to build a consumer priced video light field camera at the moment, um, but we, we know that things move quickly, so it could come. All right, so that's cool. So right after we snap a finger or something, we're going to come back because you're going to pull a camera out? Yes. All right, so we'll pull out a camera in two seconds. All right, so we're back. We actually pulled out two Lytro cameras, and now we're just going to take a look and see what they're all about. All right. So I'll should I give a quick, a quick yeah. overview of it? Or Go ahead. So th the camera is designed around its, its lens. So we have an 8x optical zoom lens at a constant aperture of f2. It shoots f2 across the whole range. That is about this much of the camera. Right. The rest of it is designed to be very simple, uh, as you've seen. We have two, bu two buttons, power button, shutter button. Now, zooming is accomplished by sliding your finger along this top surface. So there's a touch-sensitive yep. zoom. And uh, you can see that in the camera, if you're interested. Uh, and everything else is accomplished through the glass touchscreen on the back. So playback is a swipe from left to right. When you take a picture, things, you know, the picture flies off to the left to give you that cue. Uh, and we have a, a tray that you can, you can pull up from the bottom that gives you a uh, battery storage indicator, and then this creative mode, which is something that we should talk about because it's really interesting. Sure. Um, so let me ask you something. Where, what are we storing uh, photos on in here? So the storage and battery are internal. So they are, they're not removable, and uh, everything is charged and uh, through the mic micro USB port, which mm -hmm. is also where connectivity happens to the computer. So how many photos are we looking at, and what's the size of each photo? Just out of curiosity. So these two models are 8 gigabyte models. They hold 350 light field pictures, 16 megabytes apiece, uh, and they're 399. And then there's a red hot version, which is you know, our, our you know, beautiful red version that people lust after that is 16 gigabytes and holds 750 pictures. That's interesting. So what's it smell like is the question. That's what everybody wants to know out there. Sniff test. Sniff test. I don't know. <laughs> I have, to, I have to think of something good, because it's not like lasers, but what's it smell like? What do you think? I, I, I don't know. Not much. Rubber. <laughs> oh, come on. You got to get more creative than rubber. Ari, what are you thinking? I know you can't hear. Can you sniff it? 
Yo, run over here and sniff it. I want to. I want to get Ari's opinion. It smells like uh, kimchi fries. I, I actually have an idea. Why are you going that way? The camera to smell it. it. Smells like new shoes. Shiny shoes or just new shoes? You know what I think it smells like? It's kind of like a '57 Chevy, except yours is in teal and mine's in silver, so it's like a '57 Chevy. Right. I don't know where that came from, but anyway, sorry. <laughs> I got off to the sure, side yeah. there. What else do I need to know? Uh, creative mode? Yeah, creative mode. Okay, so there are two modes to the camera. There's everyday mode, which is for point and shoot, basically. You take a picture and subjects that might be common to a composition can be refocused. Uh, now, everyday mode is a mode that allows the camera owner to control the light field. So what that means is you can decide where you want refocus to be. And the way you do it is by tapping on the subject in the, in the viewfinder mm -hmm that you want to be at the center of refocus. So this is particularly good for a couple things. The first is macro. So this camera at, at full wide can actually f focus on things that are touching the lens. In fact, Ren, our CEO, took a picture of an ant crawling across the lens and you can refocus from the legs to the body. Now that's the closest foc focusing camera that I know of. Sure. Um, in fact, you, you might be able to focus in front of that front element, but we can't get to it. Um, and so that's, it's really great for super macro. Uh, another thing would be things like portraits, where you want the background to be really blurry. Now, this is something that, of course, professional portrait people do. If you own a, a point-and-shoot with a very long zoom, you could probably do yeah. it as well. Um, but traditionally, very hard for any point-and-shoot. iPhone, impossible. Um, and so you can zoom into the full 8x, tap on your subject. You will center the refocus on something around their head. But it really doesn't matter where you focus. It's, yeah, this, it's quite easy. It, there's a lot. It's forgiving. Uh, you can refocus on the nose, the, the, the eye, the ear. But what you lose in creative mode is the ability to then refocus to, for example, the background. You may not necessarily be able to pull things that are way out of range in focus. Why? Because what we're doing is taking that refocusable range. There's still this idea of a depth of field in light field photography. Now, it's a big multiple of normal depth of field, but it still exists. So in everyday mode, in essence, what we're doing is setting the camera up so you can always refocus on things that are far away. You can always get to the mountains in the background. And then you have some closest object that you can refocus on. That's why you were talking earlier about a lot of these pictures where you have like some subject in front. And the reason we're doing that is because we're showing the capabilities of the sure. camera. You know, we want to maximize the refocus range. I mean, that may not be your goal. Your goal may just be to capture the picture. Now, if you do that, there, you may get a picture that is not refocusable. It'll just be in focus. So if you zoom all the way out and you take a picture and you have a subject six feet away and something behind them, probably everything thing is going to be pretty much in focus. You'll get a little bit of refocus, but without this huge difference in depth, you don't get that refocus effect. And if you, as you zoom in, of course, things change, just like they do in a normal camera. Your depth of field becomes shallower, and in the light field domain, that happens as well. So as you zoom in, the closest refocusable object moves out. That's good if you want maximum refocus, because then your working distance is, is further away. You don't have to get in someone's face. Sure. Now, creative mode allows you to bring that range in, and as you bring it in, you lose infinity refocus. So that's what it's doing. It's bringing that whole refocus range in or out and becomes shallower as it comes in. So if we were to focus on something this far away, you know, it's just, we would get light field, depth of field of you know, some, some distance. Now, a traditional camera might be a tiny slice, so we still have a great multiple. But of course, we then can't bring things that are out of range sure. into sharpness. Uh, it's, it's, it's all interesting. Uh, when you get the full breakdown of the details of how it actually works and the functions that it has, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing, and it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. Um, yeah, what we've talked about where it's going a little bit. What else could I think about it? Handle form factor. How'd they come up with this? So the form factor, we had a couple of requirements. One was that we wanted a long zoom. So we have this, this very long zoom lens that is wide open at f2 across the, constant, the zoom range. Once we decided we wanted that, the rest of the, the design was really designed around the lens. You know, we, we didn't want to make a giant camera that you couldn't put in a jacket pocket. This is not sort of jeans pocketable, but it's jacket or man purse pocketable. Um, and so that's really where the design came from, uh, just designed to fit around this lens. Now, another one of the uh, requirements was obviously that it needed to be iconic. Now, this is the first 
camera, the first light field camera, the first fundamental shift in photography. So we wanted something that threw away all the old ideas of what photography is. I mean, you know, this grip, it's great to have a grip in a camera. And I shoot professionally, you know, I like certain cameras that are, that are ergonomically good. But you know, the grip fundamentally, there's like, there's space for a roll of film, you know, and you don't really need that there. And so there, there are a lot of these old ideas that need to be rediscovered. Now this may be radical for a lot of photographers, especially people who are very used to how things are. Um, but that's okay. I mean, we, you know, when we focus on the professional market, we will be looking at the ergonomic needs of pros. This is a consumer camera. Most people are happy to point and shoot, and you know, and it, it has a nice feel to it. So what I was thinking is, uh, when we get in, will we get independent control of the f-stops? Will we get independent control of shutter speed and things like that? Because I haven't seen examples of motion being captured. Yeah. How is it with that? So this uh, camera has a shutter and ISO, just like a traditional camera does, and our shutter speeds range from one. 15th to 1 250th of a second. Now at the moment you can't control, you cannot control those. You can tap to expose like you can on an iPhone. Um, so we sort of weight the exposure around where you've tapped. Um, we are looking at ways to bring more control to users. Um, and we are targeting normal users with this camera. So we, we understand that there is a desire to change these settings, but we want to do it in a way that is still usable to the normal user. Um, and you know, there have been discussions of having more advanced control available, and that's something that we're looking at as well. But, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard decision. I mean, we, we want to make sure we have a clear target market, and there are always going to be people who want to use it for, you know, a purpose that we didn't intend, and that's, that's totally normal. Yeah. Um, but there's a balance there. All right, uh, that's very cool. I, I just want to go play with this thing now. Uh, you definitely cleared up a bunch of things in my mind. Uh, it's good to sit down and talk to you and get the full hands-on approach or knowing what you know about it and then just thinking about it practically in my mind and, and seeing where it's going to go and what I could do with it because that's the whole point of new types of gear. It's right. not to sit there and try to compare it to something else. It's to think, what can I do with this? What will I be able to create? Because it's all about creating. It's just a different tool. And right. that's what photography or creation is all about. So, you know. I have one more thing to show uh -oh. you if you're okay with this. Sure. If, I can find it. if you can find it. Okay, so. Did you see that, Aaron? <laughs> did you see that? Well, no, she I didn't see that. Yeah, she didn't see it. Uh, so the, the first digital light field camera created was the size of a room, right? It was this gigantic array of 128 cameras. Each one was tethered to processing power and storage. Um, and this is what happened to that room full of cameras. So it was miniaturized to fit on, I don't know if you'll be able to see anything there, um, but this is a micro lens array. If you point it up, if you look at one of these lights. What's it smell like? <laughs> if you look at one of the lights, you'll see yep. you know, the rainbow ref refraction stuff wow. coming out of it. So this is an array of thousands of miniature lenses, and this is what is bonded to a CMOS sensor to create the light field sensor. So this is sort of the secret sauce in the, on the hardware side, and of course, precision placement and stuff. The rest of it happens in computation. So it's cool to be able to hold something like this that you know, is essentially 20 years in the making, or maybe 10 years of practical research, uh, and miniaturized down to something this size. So that brings up the question, can you make it bigger, and will you make it bigger? Yeah, so the, the first handheld prototype light field camera was a medium format yep. one. And, you know, we've, we've had intermediate prototypes. So we actually started from large sensor. So it is absolutely possible. Uh, it's a matter of creating something that, is a, that you can afford, you know, basically. So if we're going to do something for consumers, there's a certain price point we're targeting. Now, having a large sensor, of course, makes pictures cleaner. You know, you get all the same benefits you get with traditional photography. And, in fact, you get, you get some more interesting benefits in light field because this parallax stuff, you know, everything is tied to sensor size. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely, we are looking at larger sensor, you know, offerings sure. in the future. Well, I think that, that kind of, that's, that's, that's awesome. Now I just want to play with the thing, but thank you okay. so much for yeah. taking the time. Thanks, uh, I can't wait to just try it out and see what we come up with. All right. All right. I'm going to go do that. Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com. See ya. I feel like I'm at the doctor's Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, can you read the third line? Not at all. It says Ignu. Okay. I've actually memorized it now, and they've had to start showing me cupcakes and stuff, like the, which way the cupcake is pointed. Do you love? Up, down. I love cupcakes.